The man you see in this photo is one of the most famous men throughout all of maritime history. Most people out there, even those who aren't into ocean liners or maritime history, would be able to tell you who this man is. This man's name is Edward John Smith, and he was the captain of the ill-fated RMS Titanic, and unfortunately, he would die on the night that the Titanic went down. However, despite the fact that most people out there already know this, what I was curious about was the untold story of Captain Smith, you know? I was curious if it was possible to go back and look at all the testimony and evidence and try to piece together everything that Captain Smith did on the Titanic during the sinking. That way we could get a better understanding as to how he tried to save lives, you know, how he tried to save his ship from sinking, and ultimately I was curious as to what was the final fate of Captain Smith. Sure, everybody knows that he did die in the sinking, but my question is, how did he die, you know? Did he go down with the Titanic? Did he try to make a break for it and swim away from the ship in the icy waters? Because we do know he didn't get into a lifeboat. So, that's what I've spent all this time researching, and yeah, you're about to see the results of everything that I was able to look up on Captain Smith in today's video. So join me today as we go back and we try to tell the complete story of Captain Smith, one of the Titanic's greatest heroes. <laughs> The following video wouldn't have been possible without the collective works of Titanic Honor and Glory, Part-Time Explorer, Titanic Animations, Maritime Interactive, and the incredible Titanic book On a Sea of Glass. Please check out all of their work in the description below. We are starting off Captain Smith's story during the late evening on April the 14th, 1912. At this time, the Titanic is still steaming across the Atlantic and making very good time. Captain Smith went and attended a dinner party in the Titanic's a la carte restaurant, which was located on B-deck just aft of the aft grand staircase. After he finished his dinner, Captain Smith then headed back up to the Titanic's bridge, where Second Officer Charles Lightoller was still currently on duty. Captain Smith had a talk with Lightoller about everything that was going on with the Titanic. They discussed the ship's speed, the weather conditions, and so on and so forth. He also talked about how the weather was absolutely perfect on this particular night. It seemed like to Captain Smith and Lightoller that they could see for miles around in all directions. So, Captain Smith and Lightoller, who also discussed the many ice warnings the Titanic had received on this particular day, decided to keep the Titanic moving at its current speed of 21 knots. However, Captain Smith told Lightoller that if anything changes with the ship's weather conditions, he was to inform Captain Smith immediately. So, after this conversation was completed, Captain Smith then went and retired to his cabin, at which point Lightoller continued his duty on the Titanic's bridge, keeping a sharp eye out for any dangers that may pose a risk to the Titanic. Now, even though Captain Smith had retired to his cabin for the evening, he would still be close by just in case he was needed on the Titanic's bridge. Captain Smith's cabin was located on the port side of the Titanic, just behind the bridge within the officer's quarters on the RMS Titanic. So, as you can see, it would be very easy for Smith to get to the bridge if some kind of situation was to occur. Now, this conversation between Smith and Lightoller occurred at roughly 9.45 p.m. on board the RMS Titanic. And just 15 minutes later, 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller's shift on the Titanic's bridge was over, and he was relieved by 1st Officer William Murdoch, who assumed command of the Titanic at that time. Before Lightoller left the bridge, he had told Murdoch about his conversation with the cab captain, and he also told Murdoch that if anything was to change with the conditions that the Titanic was sailing through on that evening, or if any kind of dangerous situation was to come up, that he was to let Captain Smith know. First Officer William Murdoch said, sure, I've got it. And then right after that, Second Officer Charles Lightoller then retired to his cabin for the evening. Now, for the first hour and a half or so of First Officer William Murdoch's shift on board the Titanic, things were pretty uneventful on board Titanic. However, all that changed at 11.40 p.m. ship's time. At 11.40 p.m., an iceberg was spotted directly ahead of the RMS Titanic. First Officer William Murdoch ordered the Titanic to turn hard to starboard, which, due to tiller commands, means to turn the ship to port. However, his efforts to avoid the iceberg were futile. The Titanic was just way too close to the berg. The RMS Titanic struck the iceberg on the starboard side below the waterline, opening up the first six of the Titanic's 16 watertight compartments to the sea. Now, the force of the impact was felt pretty strongly on the bridge, and the collision wasn't unnoticed by Captain Smith. 
Captain Smith noticed the collision almost immediately after it happened. Within one minute after the Titanic had struck the iceberg, Captain Smith arrived on the Titanic's bridge to find out what had just happened. Immediately after arriving on the Titanic's bridge, Captain Smith then turned to William Murdoch and asked him what had just happened. William Murdoch informed Captain Smith that the Titanic had just struck an iceberg on the starboard side. After hearing this, Captain Smith gave William Murdoch two orders. The first order was to shut all the Titanic's watertight doors, and the second order was to stop the Titanic's engines. Now, First Officer William Murdoch had already done all of this when he was trying to avoid the iceberg in the first place, so there was nothing else for him to do at this time. Now, right after this happened, Captain Smith walked out onto the Titanic's starboard side bridge wing, which was located right here, right where my finger's pointing. And then he peeked over the Titanic's starboard side to see if he could see any visible damage along the Titanic's starboard side hull. He didn't notice any damage above the waterline. However, right after this, he then looked forward, down onto the Titanic's forward well deck, right here and notice that there was a huge chunk of ice sitting on the forward well deck that had broken off of the iceberg and landed there as a result of the collision. After all of this had happened, 4th Officer Boxhall arrived on the bridge, and once Captain Smith saw him, he ordered 4th Officer Boxhall to go down below deck and inspect for damage. Now, during all this time, Captain Smith noticed that the Titanic seemed to be handling the collision very well. He didn't even notice any type of listing with the Titanic at this time. However, remember, it's only been roughly two minutes since Iceberg Impact. So, since he thought the Titanic may be okay, he decided to go ahead and re-engage the Titanic's engines and have the ship move forward at half a head until a full damage inspection was carried out. Now, keep in mind, any ship that takes damage at sea and begins to take on water, even if that damage won't ultimately cause a ship to sink, a vessel will still list in the direction that the water is coming in due to a loss of buoyancy in that section. The only reason this didn't happen to Titanic right away was due to the fact that before the iceberg impact, the Titanic had a slight 3 degree list to port. This was because the day before, the crew of the Titanic had just put out a coal fire in the starboard side coal bunker of boiler room number 6. And in order to put out this fire, they had to move the coal out of the starboard side coal bunker, 300 tons of it, and move it into a port side coal bunker in the same boiler room. When this was done, this had a noticeable effect on the Titanic's trim, and it caused the Titanic, after this had happened, to have a slight 3 degree list to port. Now, because the Titanic had struck an iceberg on the starboard side, the reason the Titanic didn't immediately list to starboard was due to the fact that the water had to overcome the weight of the 300 tons of coal on the Titanic's port side. This is why Captain Smith didn't immediately notice a starboard list on the ship. However, this didn't take that long to go away. Around three to four minutes after the Titanic had struck the iceberg, enough water had come inside of the Titanic in order to override the weight of the 300 excess tons of coal on the Titanic's port side, and the Titanic began to list to starboard. And of course, Captain Smith noticed this right away. Around six minutes after the iceberg impact, the Titanic had listed far enough to starboard that Captain Smith decided that he had to stop the ship until he knew for certain how badly the ship was damaged. At 11.46 p.m., Captain Smith gave the order to shut down the Titanic's engines. This is the last time the Titanic would move forward under her own steam. Now, right around the time that Captain Smith gave the order to shut down the Titanic's engines, 4th Officer Boxhall arrived on the bridge once again and told Captain Smith that he did not see any flooding in the forward sections of Titanic. However, it's important to note that this first inspection by Boxhall was very brief. Right after he told Captain Smith this, he then decided to head down to the Titanic's mailroom and see if there was any flooding in that particular area on the Titanic. Now, at the time of the iceberg impact, the Titanic had been operating at near maximum steam pressure. However, after the Titanic hit the iceberg and Captain Smith gave the order to stop the engines for the last time, the steam pressure now had nowhere to go since it wasn't being fed into the Titanic's engines anymore. The steam pressure within the Titanic was continuing to build up and build up. Now, if something wasn't done to relieve this steam pressure, then the Titanic seriously had a risk of potentially exploding. Remember, you can't shut off a steam engine like you shut off a gas-powered engine we have today. However, the builders of the Titanic had taken this into account, and what they had done was they had equipped the Titanic with safety valves, 
And once the steam pressure within the Titanic had exceeded its maximum limit, these safety valves would automatically lift up and let this excess steam pressure out. This started on board the Titanic at 11.58 p.m. And while this would stop the Titanic from potentially exploding due to an overload of steam pressure, the process of venting out this steam was extremely loud and it made it very hard for Captain Smith and the other crewmen on the Titanic's boat deck to communicate with themselves and the Titanic's passengers. The steam pressure inside of the Titanic would continue to be vented out over the course of the next hour to an hour and a half. So this really did hurt them when they were trying to evacuate the Titanic. However, nothing could be done about this. They had to get rid of that steam pressure somehow. Now at roughly 11.50 p.m., Captain Smith headed out to do his own brief inspection of the Titanic. Exactly where he went during this first inspection is unclear. However, he returned to the bridge just seven minutes later at 11.57 p.m. and told the crew to begin prepping the Titanic's lifeboats. He didn't tell them to swing the boats out yet. He just told them to go through the initial preparation steps for the boats just in case they were needed. A few minutes later, Captain Smith left the bridge once again and headed down to the Titanic's engine room, where he met up with the Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, and the Titanic's chief engineer, Joseph Bell. Once these three men met up, they then headed down Scotland Road to head down to the forward sections of the Titanic to do a more detailed inspection of their stricken liner. As Smith, Andrews, and Bell headed down Scotland Road, which was a corridor located on the Titanic's E-deck level that spanned nearly the entire length of the ship, one of the first areas that they wanted to check out was the Titanic's mail room, which was located in the Titanic's fourth watertight compartment. However, the mail room was located on a deeper deck within the Titanic. The mail room was essentially a two-story complex that was occupied on both the Titanic's Orlop deck and G deck. Now, when these three men arrived in the area where the mail room was, there was a staircase there that allowed them to look down from the E deck level all the way down to the G deck level, so they could basically see the first floor of the mail room. However, when these men got there, it was around 12, 10 a.m., and they saw some postal workers on the Titanic's E deck level trying to move bags of mail that they saved from the post office or mail room and get it up to a higher deck. When these three men looked down that staircase down to the Titanic's G deck level and the mail room, they saw that G deck was already completely underwater. There was no way any of these men could get into the Titanic's mail room. As soon as Smith, Andrews, and Bell saw the situation in the Titanic's mail room, the three men immediately turned around and began to head away from the area. Right around this time, a stewardess by the name of Amy Robinson was standing in the area where Smith and Andrews just walked past her, and she overheard Andrews tell Captain Smith, well, three have gone already, Captain. When Andrews told Smith that three had gone already, what he was referring to was the Titanic's first three watertight compartments, and basically what he was telling Smith was that these compartments were already completely flooded. Right after this very brief exchange between Smith and Andrews, Smith, Andrews, and Bell all went their own separate ways, and each man had their own tasks they were going to perform on board the Titanic. Thomas Andrews and Joseph Bell both went out to do their own inspections of the Titanic, while Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge to begin overseeing the initial stages of the evacuation. Remember, the Titanic was not yet declared doomed. However, Captain Smith wanted to be ready just in case the worst case scenario should be confirmed. Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge at roughly 12, 12, 12, 13 a.m. And once he got there, he ordered all of the Titanic's lifeboats to be swung out over the ship's side. He also told his crew to go down below deck and begin waking up the Titanic's passengers. He also told the crew to get them up onto the boat deck as quickly as possible. And he also said to make sure that the passengers had their life jackets on. Right after this order was given, Captain Smith then headed to the Marconi room where he met up with Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, the Titanic's wireless operators. He told them to get ready to send out one of the Titanic's distress calls. However, he told them not to do it until he returned and told them to do so. He didn't want to send out a distress call message prematurely. After this happened, Captain Smith returned to the bridge where he would wait on Thomas Andrews to return to him and let him know if the Titanic was going to sink or not. Thomas Andrews arrived on the Titanic's bridge just a short time later and told Captain Smith the terrible news. The Titanic was too badly damaged and she was going to sink. Right after hearing this, Captain Smith gave the order to begin filling the lifeboats with the Titanic's passengers, and he also gave his famous order of women and children first. 
Right after he did this, Captain Smith returned to the bridge to begin working out the Titanic's actual position so he could give it to the wireless operator so they could put it in the Titanic's distress call message. However, once Captain Smith worked out the Titanic's position, he made a slight error when he was trying to figure out where the ship was, and the distress call position he gave Jack Phillips and Harold Bride was roughly 20 miles to the west of where Titanic actually was. However, he didn't catch this mistake, and he gave it to the Titanic's wireless operators, and they began to transmit the Titanic's first distress call messages at roughly 12.27 a.m. Now, with the exception of the private meeting between Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews, it seems like that there was never any type of formal meeting between Captain Smith and the other members of the Titanic's crew about the fact that the Titanic was actually sinking. And honestly, I can understand why. Because think about it. All of the Titanic's crew members that are assisting with the evacuation already know that something serious is going on because they're prepping the lifeboats. And Smith already had his officers out there, you know, working on or telling them, you know, hey, we need to lower these boats away, fill them up with women and children first, you know. They knew something serious was going on without being told for certain that, hey, yeah, we're done. And think about it. If Captain Smith would have pulled all of his crew up to the Titanic's bridge to tell them, hey, yeah, we're sinking, well, in a situation like a sinking ship, Every second counts in a situation like this. So for every minute he had the crew in the bridge just to tell them that, yeah, we're sinking, that's another minute that they've lost in launching the Titanic's lifeboats, helping the passengers get up on deck, and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Unlike what we saw in the James Cameron film, there was no official meeting between Captain Smith and all the members of the Titanic's crew. Word of the coming disaster was simply spread by word of mouth only. Immediately after leaving the Marconi room, Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge where he ran into 4th Officer Boxhall, who had returned to the bridge after hearing reports that a mystery ship had been spotted off of the Titanic's port side. When Boxhall ran into Captain Smith, he asked Smith if the situation was serious. Captain Smith told Boxhall that it was, and he also told Boxhall that Thomas Andrews didn't give the ship more than an hour to an hour and a half to live. Upon learning about the mystery ship seen off of the Titanic's port side, Captain Smith also began thinking about ways to try to contact this mystery ship, because if it could be signaled and reached, this ship could come over and save everybody on board the Titanic. However, what Captain Smith did not realize at that time was that all efforts to contact this mystery ship would be completely in vain. We are resuming Captain Smith's story at 12.28 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic. At this time, Captain Smith is on the Titanic's bridge with 4th Officer Boxall, and the two men are discussing the mystery ship seen off of the Titanic's port side. Now, during this exact same conversation, 4th Officer Boxhall asked Captain Smith if the situation was serious. Captain Smith then told Boxhall that it was. He also told Boxhall that Thomas Andrews, the Titanic's designer, didn't give the ship more than an hour to an hour and a half to live. Captain Smith also informed Boxhall that he had given the Titanic's position to Jack Phillips and Harold Bride to put into the Titanic's distress call message. Now, during this conversation, Boxhall informed Captain Smith that the Titanic was actually a little bit further ahead than where the ship's official position in the logbook said the Titanic was. After hearing this, Captain Smith then told Boxhall to go and double check the ship's position and give that updated position to Jack Phillips and Harold Bride to put into the distress call message. After this brief conversation between Smith and Boxhall, Boxhall then went to try to figure out the Titanic's position, then he was going to compare the position he got with what Captain Smith got. And sure enough, after he did this, he discovered that Captain Smith's estimate to the Titanic's position was off. So, Boxhall updated the position and then took that update to Jack Phillips and Harold Bride so they could put it in the Titanic's distress call message. Now, it should also be pointed out that while Boxhall's estimate wasn't as far off as Captain Smith's, Boxhall's position wasn't accurate either. Captain Smith's estimate as to the Titanic's position was off by roughly 20 miles, while Boxhall's estimate was off by roughly 13 miles. Now, it was Boxhall's coordinates that the RMS Carpathia would use when it was trying to find the Titanic survivors. So, honestly, it was kind of semi-dumb luck that the Carpathia was able to find the Titanic survivors. Although, I do have a theory on how the Carpathia may have stumbled across the Titanic survivors. However, I'm not going to be talking about that in this video. I did cover it in another video. If you would like to watch that video, I will include a link to that video in the description below. 
After Captain Smith learned about the mystery ship seen off of the Titanic's port side, he became extremely hopeful that that ship would eventually come and help rescue everybody who was on board the Titanic. Now, from Captain Smith's perspective on the bridge, he determined that that ship was roughly 10 miles or so away from the Titanic. The Titanic could clearly see the ship on the horizon, so logically that ship should be able to see the Titanic as well. He informed Jack Phillips and Harold Bride about the mystery ship and told them to try to contact it. He also told other members of his crew to try to signal the ship with the Titanic's Morse lamps, and he also ordered distress rockets to be fired as well. Now, that mystery ship was later determined to be the SS Californian, and they could see the Titanic off in the distance. However, the Californian's radio operator had went to bed, so the Californian didn't have its radio turned on, so it didn't pick up the Titanic's distress call. And the reason the Californian didn't respond to the Titanic's more slams or distress rockets was because there was a weird weather phenomenon going on called a cold water mirage, and it was distorting the light coming from the Titanic towards the mystery ship. So it basically confused the officers on the Californian as to what they were seeing on the horizon. But anyway, Captain Smith would continue to make efforts to try to contact this mystery ship throughout the sinking, and as some of the lifeboats were lowered over the Titanic side, Captain Smith even told those lifeboats to try to row towards the mystery ship. Captain Smith really did put a lot of his hopes on that strange ship seen off in the horizon. However, unfortunately, the Californian would never take notice of the Titanic situation, and the ship never came to lend aid to the RMS Titanic. Now, just a real quick side note here. Before all of you all watching this video, jump into the comments section and start raging about the Californian and typing things out like, how come the Californian didn't investigate the Titanic? Even with the weird weather phenomenon going on, surely they would have noticed that something weird was going on with that ship off in the distance, you know? Even if the Californian couldn't make out the Titanic's Morse lamp, why didn't they even try to contact that ship, even if they didn't know it was the Titanic? Why did the Californian ignore the distress rockets? Surely that ship could have seen that, right? Well... Before you all type out all that, I want you to know that the Californian did notice the Titanic, and they did take steps to try to contact the Titanic. However, I would argue that the only thing the Californian is truly guilty of is just not doing enough. They did take some steps, however, they didn't do enough, and I'll explain this really briefly. You see, the Californian did try to contact the Titanic by means of the Californian's Morse lamp. However, just like the issue that the Titanic's crew was facing, the weird weather phenomenon going on that night distorted the Californian's Morse lamp light just like it did the Titanic's. So people on both ships thought that they were seeing something, however they weren't really sure, you know, they were both dealing with that. And when it comes to the Titanic's distress rockets, well you see, this is where the Titanic's crew messed up a little bit, and it's still unclear as to why they did this. You see, rockets can mean a multitude of things at sea. One such thing that they can mean is company signals. And the thing is, the Titanic's crew did not launch its rockets correctly for them to mean distress. The law in 1912 is very clear on this. For rockets launched by a ship at sea to mean distress, rockets have to be launched in one minute intervals. However, in the case of Titanic, its rockets were going up every five minutes or so. So while it is true that the Californian's crew did see the rockets being launched from Titanic, well, due to this big time delay, they just didn't understand. You know, they didn't know what was going on. And this, this brings up my ultimate point here. You see, if I would have been the captain of the Californian, whose name was Stanley Lord, if I saw a ship off in the distance and I thought the ship might have been acting weird, I thought I saw distress rockets, or I saw rockets going up from the ship, even if they weren't launched in a way to mean distress. I would at least go and wake up the wireless guy and have him try to contact the ship by that means, just to make sure that everything is okay. You know, when in doubt, play it safe. You know, you want to, you want to make sure everything's okay, even if you're confused about what's going on and you don't know for certain if something's wrong. Just play it safe. That is the big thing that I think the Californian's crew is guilty of. They just, they didn't take more steps than they should have just to make sure that everything was okay with that mystery ship. And unfortunately, everything was not okay. The Californian would remain in its current position until the Titanic sank. And they wouldn't learn until the next morning after the wireless guy woke up about what had really happened to the ship that was seen off in the distance. 
Over the course of the next few minutes, the Titanic would successfully contact a good number of ships by means of the Titanic's Marconi wireless system. And, at 12.37 a.m., the Titanic would finally contact its would-be savior ship, the RMS Carpathia, which was somewhere around 55 miles away from the Titanic. Once the Carpathia's crew learned that the Titanic was in trouble and sinking, the Carpathia immediately changed course and began to head towards the Titanic. However, at being more than 55 miles away, it would take the Carpathia around four hours to reach the Titanic's position. Harold Bride took this message to Captain Smith and told him around what time the Carpathia were, would arrive. However, once Captain Smith learned that it would take the Carpathia around four hours to reach the Titanic, while he didn't tell Harold Bride directly, he knew that that wouldn't be fast enough to reach the Titanic's position. All Captain Smith could do at this point was continue to assist with the evacuation, and just hope that maybe, just maybe, another ship could reach the Titanic in time. Now, another thing that I was trying to figure out when I was researching the story of Captain Smith for today's video was I was trying to find out if there was any truth in the rumor about him that states that during the evacuation of the Titanic, Captain Smith was seen and it appeared to those who saw him that he wasn't handling the situation very well, you know, he was staring off into space, you know, and just not being the type of person that a captain should be in an emergency crisis like this. And as I was reading Captain Smith's story and keeping an eye out for anything that could back up any of the claims made in this rumor, at first I wasn't coming across anything that gave any justification to this rumor whatsoever. It seemed like that Captain Smith was doing the best job he could under incredibly stressful circumstances. I mean, I can't imagine what it must have been like for him on the night that the Titanic went down. However, I did start to see some of the behaviors mentioned in that rumor right around this point in the sinking, you know, right after he found out that the Carpathia wasn't going to arrive at the Titanic's location in time and everything. And honestly, it makes sense that he may have gotten a little bit overwhelmed mentally at this point in time because, you know, after he learned that the Carpathia wasn't going to reach the Titanic in time, Captain Smith would have known that there weren't enough lifeboats on the Titanic for everyone on board. And under the best case scenario, that around half of the people on the Titanic were going to die. And that's if all the lifeboats were filled to capacity and there were no issues with the evacuation. So, I mean, how would you handle knowing something like that? Knowing that half the people on the ship that you're in charge of were going to die in the next hour or two? I mean... That would be so overwhelming for somebody mentally. I mean, I can't even imagine it. Now, over the course of the next hour or so, this is the point in time where it seems like that Captain Smith may have been a little bit distant in his thoughts. And I did find an official story to back up this claim. The story comes from a passenger on the Titanic by the name of Huel Warner. And he encountered Captain Smith during the full-on evacuation of the Titanic and he saw Captain Smith ordering some of the Titanic's passengers to go down from the boat deck and wait for a lifeboat right around here on the A-deck promenade. And Captain Smith's intention was to have lifeboats lowered from the boat deck, go down to the A-deck promenade, and then they would step through those windows and get into a lifeboat. However, Hugh Warner told Captain Smith, well, wait, don't you know that there are glass windows? Like, there's glass in all of these promenade windows there. You know, you'd have to open those before you could get passengers through them and get them into a lifeboat. And Captain Smith went, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, have those passengers come back up. And so the ultimate question is, why would Captain Smith make this mistake, you know? Why would he forget that there are glass windows down there on the A-deck promenade? And it's probably because he was feeling overwhelmed mentally. You know, he just wasn't thinking clearly. And another reason why he may have made this mistake was because of the last ship that he sailed on. You know, the last ship that he was in command of before the Titanic was the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic, which was the near identical sister ship to the Titanic. However, unlike the Titanic, the Olympic didn't have the enclosed A-deck promenade like the Titanic did. You know, on the Olympic, the promenade, all of the windows there were open. Anybody could step through them. They didn't have the glass there like the Titanic did. So it's possible that during this mental instability, you know, phase that he was going through at this time, that he may have made this mistake. So anyway, this was one official story that I found that seemed to back up the claim a little bit that he may have been somewhat distant at a certain point in the evacuation. However, 
for the most part, Captain Smith was alert and doing everything he could to save as many lives as possible on the Titanic. And he would snap out of this mental distant phase not long after this story occurred. Now, over the course of the next hour or so, this is the point in time where Captain Smith's activities on the Titanic are, for the most part, unknown. There are some scattered reports that he was seen on the Titanic's port side helping assist with the evacuation. However, these are just very brief and scattered reports. There's also another claim that he was present in the officer's quarters when Chief Officer Henry Wilde distributed the firearms that were on the Titanic to some of the Titanic's officers. So, based on this claim, I would guess that it's most likely that Captain Smith, for the most part, remained in close proximity to the Titanic's bridge, so if anybody needed him, they would know where to find him. I would guess that this is probably why there aren't too many reports of him during this point in the sinking. This was because he was always hanging out at the very front of the Titanic and not near the lifeboats where a good number of people could see him. The next confirmed sighting of Captain Smith occurred at roughly 1.56 a.m. from within the Titanic's bridge. At this point in time, Captain Smith was seen talking with another one of his officers. It was either Chief Officer Henry Wilde or Second Officer Charles Lightoller, we're not sure which. But anyway, the men were discussing how, at this point in time, the rate at which the Titanic was sinking seemed to accelerate. The men knew that they did not have that much time left before the Titanic went down. The men were also discussing that a good number of the lifeboats that had already been launched from the Titanic, well, they could tell that these boats had nowhere near their maximum carrying capacity in them. There was a lot more room for more people within these boats that had already left the ship. So, with time rapidly running out, Captain Smith did the only thing he could do. He took his speaking megaphone and walked out onto the Titanic's port side boat deck right around here and yelled through the megaphone at all the lifeboats that were currently in the water to come back to the Titanic and pick up more passengers. This is the captain calling for the boats. Return to the ship. Pull back, pull back, pull back to the ship. Pull back to the ship. Come around to the starboard side to bring aboard more passengers. Pull back. All boats pull back. This is the captain. Pull back to the ship. However, despite Captain Smith's orders, not a single lifeboat returned to the Titanic to pick up more passengers. However, one lifeboat did attempt the captain's orders. This lifeboat was lifeboat number two, which had just been launched from the very front of the Titanic on the port side, right around the area where Captain Smith was yelling at the other lifeboats through his speaking megaphone. This lifeboat was led by 4th Officer Boxhall, and he did attempt to follow the captain's orders. Captain Smith told this lifeboat to go over to the Titanic's starboard side and pick up more people from there. Now, this was an extremely difficult thing for Boxhall to do because his lifeboat, as I said, was launched on the very front of the Titanic's port side. So, once lifeboat number two touched the water, what Boxhall decided to do was sail his lifeboat along the Titanic's port side, go around the Titanic's stern, and cross over into the starboard side, and this is where he would pick up more passengers. However, by the time that Boxhall attempted this, too much time had passed and the Titanic was in its final stages of sinking. So, Boxall had no choice but to pull away from the Titanic without picking up any additional passengers. Captain Smith continued to try to get the lifeboats to return to the Titanic for right around a minute or so. After this amount of time had passed, he saw that no boats were returning to the Titanic, so he abandoned his efforts to get the boats to come back. At this point in time, Captain Smith knew that the end was near for the Titanic, so he then set out to go and release as many of his crewmen as possible, so these men at least had a shot at saving their own lives. The first place Captain Smith went to was the Marconi Room, where, despite the fact that the Titanic's power was so weak at this point it could barely send out a signal, Jack Phillips and Harold Brad were still trying to send out a very weak distress signal from the Titanic. Captain Smith walked into the Marconi room and told the two men in there that they had done their full duty, they could do no more, and it was time for them to abandon their cabin and save their own lives. However, despite the fact that Captain Smith gave the men this order, Jack Phillips and Harold Brad chose to remain in the Marconi room for a few more minutes, trying desperately to get another ship to the Titanic before the ship went down. I did make a complete video on the story of Jack Phillips and Harold Brad. If you would like to watch that video, there is a link for it in the description below. After Captain Smith released Jack Phillips and Harold Bratt and left the Marconi room, 
Reports are kind of hit and miss as to where Captain Smith went next. The general consensus seems to be that after he left the Marconi room, he headed back out onto the Titanic's boat deck, where he continued to release more and more members of his crew and told them to try to save their own lives. This seems to have went on for roughly 10 minutes or so. After this happened, Captain Smith then returned to the bridge, where the last official sighting of Captain Smith took place. It is now 2.11 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic. The Titanic's final plunge is about to begin. The Titanic's band is playing their final piece, Near My God to Thee. And all of the lifeboats, with the exception of two boats, collapsible A and B, which are stored on the roof of the officer's quarters by the first funnel, have left the Titanic. The remaining members of the Titanic's crew that are still on board the ship are trying desperately to get collapsible A and B ready for launch. Captain Smith is currently on the Titanic's bridge with the Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, who are watching the water slowly but surely starting to make its way up onto the Titanic's boat deck. As the water begins to flood over the Titanic's port side bridge wing, Captain Smith turns to Thomas Andrews and says to him, there's no use in staying any longer. She is going. We have to go. At this point in time, Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews are seen jumping over the Titanic's port side bridge wing and swimming away from the Titanic, never to be seen again. After Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews jumped from the Titanic's port side bridge wing and into the sea and swam away from the Titanic, we don't know for certain what happened to Captain Smith after this. The only thing we do know for certain is that he did die in the waters around where the Titanic sank, and unfortunately his body was never recovered. Now, after the Titanic went down, there are some unconfirmed reports that Smith may have been seen alive briefly after the Titanic sank. The most popular story that claims to have seen Smith happened at Collapsible Lifeboat B, which, where this lifeboat was one of the final to leave the Titanic and the crew was in such a hurry to launch it, well, this lifeboat had accidentally gotten flipped upside down. And the men who were trying to stay alive on this boat were literally balancing on top of this upside down lifeboat, just trying to keep it from throwing all these men into the sea. It was a very delicate balancing act that everybody dealing with this boat was having to do. The story claims that while these men were balancing on Collapsible B, a man came up to them and asked if he could get on board this boat, at which point another man who was on the boat told him, no, there's too many people on this boat. If we take on one more person, this boat will sink. At which point, the man in the water simply said, All right, Ben, I understand. Good luck, and God bless you. And this man swam away. The story claims that this man in the water was Captain Smith. However, as I said, the story is unconfirmed. It's just the most popular story to try to figure out what happened to Captain Smith after the Titanic went down. And with that final story out of the way, now all of you watching this video know the complete story of Captain Smith and what he did on board the RMS Titanic on the night of the sinking. And guys, after watching this video, I'm more convinced than ever that Captain Smith truly was one of the biggest heroes on board the Titanic that night. You know, based on everything that I saw, it's clear to me that he was really trying as hard as he could to save as many people as possible from the Titanic before the ship went down. All those claims out there that Captain Smith was just not handling the situation very well and not being a good captain, just staring off into space and all that, you know, I mean... Sure, it seems like he did have a few moments where he got a little bit overwhelmed, but he snapped out of it shortly after, and he continued to do the best job he could under incredibly difficult circumstances. So honestly, I truly do believe that Captain Smith was one of the biggest heroes on board the Titanic, and I honestly believe his story should never be forgotten. This is Sam from Historic Travels, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope all of you out there have a great day, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a great day, everybody.